My name is Nathan, youth and college pastor here. If I haven't met you, I'd love to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, This is the second Sunday of the month. That's the time when Pastor Joe goes to Pathfinder, and usually I'm in here. So welcome. Glad to be in here with you guys today. I want to begin by talking about bucket lists. I don't know about you, but I am a huge fan of bucket lists. I've been working on my bucket list for years, and some of my bucket list goals I have completed, like skydiving and running a marathon, like those are two of my big goals. Some of my bucket list goals I haven't done yet, like roll a giant hay bale down a hill. I don't know why, that just, the something that came up to me in like seventh grade, I'm like, that sounds like so much fun watching this thing just go down a hill. Like, I don't know why, that just sounds like a blast. Or go to like the fanciest restaurant I could ever think of and like dress really nice, but go and eat there all by myself. I don't Those are some of my bucket list goals. One of my other bucket list goals was to get onto a Megatron at like a big sports event. And for years I had gone to sports events and I was, I was breaking out my best dance moves. You've, you've seen some of them. Like this is like my go-to cyclone that been doing that dance move for years. And like, I've been trying to get on a Megatron for so long. Finally, two years ago, I was at a Thunder game, the Thunder Celtics game, and man, I was, I was breaking out every move I got. I mean, I was giving it all, and finally, I get on the Megatron, my bucket list goal complete. Boy, howdy, yes, I get on this, this Megatron. It was great. It was really quite perfect, a great experience. But just to get on the Megatron, that's not the only time I go crazy at sporting events. Sometimes in my house, like yesterday at the Sooners game, the five-hour game, I don't know if you watched that. Like, that was a commitment just to watch that game. But, like, I'm screaming at the TV, trying not to wake anyone up. And, like, I'm getting excited. I'm getting into it. Every game I go to, I'm like a super fan. I go wild. I go crazy at these games. If you are like me at all, and you go crazy at these ga- at any sporting event, and you kind of go wild, you will be kind of like me this morning, and you will likely feel quite convicted. So uh, just going with you on that. Uh, I was qu- I'm quite convicted by this message, because here's the reality. I go crazy for sporting events. I- I'm willing to pull out my craziest dance moves. When referees make a bad call, you'll hear my voice. I respectfully disagree, sir. That's like my favorite line I call all the time. And I, I yell that in like, in sporting events, I will go wild. But here's the question. How passionate am I when it comes to faith and it comes to worship? Am I as passionate in worship as I am at a sporting event? You see, sometimes we might be worshiping things that we don't even realize that we are worshiping. I want to ask a really simple question today. Who do you worship? Some of us, we worship sports. Some of us, we worship the sports athletes that are playing the sports. Some of us worship actors or actresses, or maybe food is what we worship, or our friends or our family. And sometimes we have this habit to worship things more so than we worship God. What does it look like to truly give everything to God and give more devotion to him than to the other things in our life? I want to begin by looking in this passage of scripture. This is in Daniel. We've been going through this series all for the last several weeks. This series is called Winning the Battle with Culture. And we're talking about in culture, in the society that we live in, how can we stand up and stand firm for what we believe for actual biblical truth? We relate a lot to Daniel. This this microphone is crazy. We relate a lot to Daniel because Daniel was thrown from his community where where there were a lot of other believers in God. And he was thrown into this new community in Babylonia where they were not for God. They were taking him out of his culture and making him do these new things. In this passage in Daniel chapter 3, we look at something new that they're asking him to do. Read with me starting in verse 1. It says this. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of God 60 cubits high and 60 cubits wide. That's about 90 feet high, 90 feet wide. And set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. 
So all those people that we just mentioned and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up and they stood before it. So picture with me, we have this big giant gold statue, 90 feet wide, 90 feet high. King Nebuchadnezzar set this up and said, everybody must come before this statue and worship this statue. Passage continues in verse four. Then Herod loudly proclaimed nations and peoples of every language. This is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, several instruments I've never even heard of, <laughs> you must fall down and worship the image of gold the King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will Im immediately be thrown in to the blazing furnace. Most of us have heard this story before of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or to bed we go, as I learned as a kid. We've learned this story. We've heard this. They were to bow down to this gold statue, to this image, and they had to literally take this posture of surrender. How often do we take surrender to other gods except for our God? <laughs> you see, it's not as obvious for us in our culture because for them, their idols were pretty obvious. They had the idols of gold. They had the wooden idols, and, and you weren't supposed to worship those. It was clear of what you weren't supposed to worship. To us, we have so many idols that we don't even peg as idols, such as sports, such as family, such as friends such as movies, TV shows, how often do we put those things above God? This story in Daniel chapter 3, it continues. As it continues, uh, they've, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow down. They don't listen. They don't fall to the trap of King Nebuchadnezzar, and they don't worship him. King Nebuchadnezzar finds word about this, and he is not super thrilled about it. And so they have a meeting. The, these three men have a meeting with King Nebuchadnezzar. And let's pick up there in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If you are thrown into a blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Then I love this verse, verse 18. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. <laughs> Love that. That's one of the most powerful statements of faith in the entire Bible. They say, listen, King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not worship this idol. We will not bow down. We will not take this posture of surrender because we believe, we know that God can save us from the fiery furnace. We believe that he will save us from the fiery furnace. And then they say, but even if he doesn't, we are still going to be faithful to our God. We are still only going to worship the one and only God because our God is so great and so perfect and so mighty and so powerful. They said that is the only God we are going to worship. They took a firm stand. My question for us in the here and now, is God the only God that we worship? Or are we partaking in some false worship, some false idols in our culture in the here and now? I want first point today, the secular culture slash world is going to push us to worship its gods. They're going to push us to worship things that we know we probably shouldn't be worshiping. They're going to push us to maybe be embarrassed of worshiping our God, the real God. We just read in, in Daniel chapter 3, the verse 5, where it says, As soon as you hear this sound, you must bow down. You must worship this God. What is our culture asking us to bow down and worship? There's so many different things. If we look around on social media, if we look around uh, in, in sports and many different gods of our culture, and we don't even realize that they are becoming the gods of our culture. And here's the reality. 
when we worship any of those gods of our culture, we are going to be let down every single time because here's the reality. Sooners have potential to lose two games in a row. It happened. <laughs> there are so many different things that we make our gods that will let us down. I'm not saying anyone does this, but if you were to make me your me your God, you will be let down because I am a crummy God. <laughs> if you were to make your spouse your God, you will be let down because anybody else is a crummy God. If you make an athlete or an actor or actress your God, you will be let down every single time because they make only God that deserves all of our praise, all of our devotion, all of our worship. Who gets the majority of your worship? God or things of this world? I can think of a, several times in my life where I've been asked like, Nathan, why, why do you worship like that? Sometimes if you see me worshiping, like I'll raise my hands a little bit. I'll kind of get a little jiggy with it. Like I'll dance and like, sometimes I just can't contain it because I love to worship my God, the King of Kings. Like I just can't hold it back. I got to give everything to my God. You can see our worship team up here, and man, they're giving their everything to God because we care about God. He deserves all of our worship and all of our devotion. If I'm willing to yell out at a sports game, I better be willing to jump and dance a little bit for my God who created me out of nothing. Are we willing to give everything to God and all of our devotion and all of our worship to him? You see, God's view on this, it's really, really clear. We look into the Ten Commandments. We read this in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 3. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. Super clear. <laughs> For them, it was really clear. No idols, no statues. For us, this means literally no other gods. Do, are we making something else our God? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That is, God is the only God that we should be serving. We cannot have two masters. God can only be our only master. Is he our one and only master? Every year at Chi Alpha, I uh, have a student leadership team. Several of our student leaders are in here right now. And in the student leadership team, I give our seniors a chance to speak if they would like. They preach at Chi Alpha. This last Wednesday, one of my seniors, Jonah Year Out, many of you know him, he's a phenomenal kid, he got a chance to preach. And he was preaching kind of on this same idea. He was talking about how, how you need to own your faith, you need to know your faith, you need to grow your faith, and you need to take ownership of your faith. And as he was talking about this, he started to share his testimony. And as he was sharing his testimony, he talked about four years ago, he said he was owned by playing soccer. Like every single day of the week, he played soccer. On Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, he had high school soccer practice. On Tuesday and Thursday, he had a club soccer practice. Then he had to fit in a goalie training on top of that. And then a Saturday and a Sunday were reserved for games. So pretty much seven days of the week, he was playing soccer. He goes, soccer owned me. And then he looked at the students and he said, you know what I did? <laughs> he said, I literally quit soccer. He goes, I realized in my life, soccer controlled me and soccer was my God. So I had to quit soccer. And then he looked at the students. He said, now I'm not telling you guys that you need to all quit your sports because then Pastor Nathan would get all these calls from all the, all the coaches and whatnot. I'm not saying you need to quit your sports, but how can we manage to still play the sports and give everything over to God? Jonah said for him, his only option was to completely quit. But there are things that we can do to make sure that God is our God and our number one priority. Is God our number one priority. I once heard it like this in college, our priorities have to be in line and when our priorities get out of line, it messes everything up. Our number one priority in life has to be God. Our number two priority, that's our family. Number three priority, that can be your work, your job, your occupation. Number four is everything else that follows there. But here's what happens way too often. We have those priorities. We know those should be our priorities, but sometimes we flip-flop those priorities. Sometimes many of us, on purpose or on accident, we put our family above God. 
that messes everything up. Sometimes we put the fun things that we like to do above God. Sometimes some of us, we get so busy in our work season and we put our work in front of God. God has to be our number one priority. If he isn't number one on our list, we have messed up our priority li list and it messes up everything else inside of our lives. God has to be there and must be the first and foremost in our life in every single part of our life. Idolatry is when we put anything or anyone on a higher place of importance in our life than God. My assumption is that it is quite possible that some of us are practicing idolatry and we don't even realize it. I would say for me, myself, for several years, I was practicing idolatry when it comes to sports and I was really quite oblivious. Also, I was justifying it. I was acting like, oh, you know what, I'm, just for a little bit I'm doing this. But honestly, I would think about sports a lot more than I would think about God. We can't have any gods before our God. Idolatry is when we put anything in front of God. What we do with our time and money reveals more about which gods we serve than what we say. In other words, let me put it like this. You want to know where your priorities are? Show me your calendar and show me your bank account and we can really prove who your gods are. Where is your time? Are you investing your time in kingdom ministry purposes and things that build the kingdom and things that help proclaim the gospel? Or are we investing our time in other things that, that honestly are more so a waste of a time? Some of the things are really good things that we do, but sometimes our calendar shows us that we put our priorities out of order. Show me your bank account is another way to say it. Where are you spending your money? Just this uh, last week, two weeks ago, I actually went to Sooner's game. It was for my birthday, and uh, I love going. Then we got a call back from uh, the athletic department. They said, hey, we have, for the first time in 25 years, we have season tickets available. Would you like to buy season tickets? And, and like, I, I love the football games. I love going. I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I'm, I'm really quite intrigued. And, and he's like, it's like $1,500 to buy two tickets for the season. I'm like, Okay, so in my head, I start thinking, all right, $1,500, I, if I can switch a few things around, I might be able to justify this. Okay, I, th I think I can make this happen. This, this sounds good. And then after talking with m my wife, Jordan, she's always the voice of reason. She, she's phenomenal, but she's like, okay. And we, we start discussing a little bit and like, is that really where we want to spend all of our time? Is that really where we want to spend that money? And, and as I started thinking about this, if somebody came up to me, somebody who's like, man, Nathan, I, I really need $1,500, and this is for kingdom purpose, this is for missions, I would think about that a lot harder than I would think about spending on the Sooners game, if I'm completely honest with you. You see, what I'm doing is I'm making the sports my God. That $1,500 seems like a lot more money when it's for stuff that doesn't Im impact my life immediately. <laughs> show me your bank account and show me your calendar. I heard that said once, and that, that changes our perspective on a lot of things. That really tells us where is my priorities? Is it God or is it something else? Second point that I want to get across today is this. False God worship comes in many forms. There's many different ways that With this story in King Nebuchadnezzar, the statue that he set up, basically what he was doing is King Nebuchadnezzar set up three different areas of false god worship that he was really trying to get them to worship. And I want to talk about these three areas by three gods that they had back then during this time. This first god, first god was called Mammon. Mammon is the worship of possessions. In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, it says this, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will de be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This word mammon means the worship of possessions, this worship of our money, this worship of the things that we like. We want to have the nicest boat, the nicest clothes, the nicest shoes, the nicest house. We want to have the biggest and the best. 
And one thing that starts to happen in our culture is we begin to worship these possessions. These possessions ultimately become our God and our priorities get flopped and we put that above God. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar, he set up this gold image. This image was this idea of possessions, this idea of the mammon, this idea that, man, this is what is important, and you should bow down to this this possessions, this nice-looking thing. The second type of God that, that we have the tendency to worship is the God of Baal, and I learned how to say that correctly in college from Dr. Mike Fillingham. Thank you. And, and I never would have thought it's Baal is how you say it. But Baal is the worship of power. In other words, Baal is this worship of pride, this worship of self, that I think that myself is better than anybody else. And, and I want the biggest and the best for myself. I want people to like me. I want people to love me. Man, I think that many of us have a tendency to do this, including myself. We have this pride issue, and I'm all about me. I'm all about me, me, me. And I don't think about you, you, you enough. How often do we think about others compared to ourselves? The gospel is pretty clear. Love your neighbor as yourself. Second greatest commandment, love other people. We are to love God and we are to love others more than we love ourselves. But we get in this tendency to love ourselves, to over escalate ourselves, to almost make ourselves the God. This becomes idolatry. With King Nebuchadnezzar, that's exactly what he did with the statue. He did this. Uh, and ultimately worship him because he thought he was so great. He thought he was perfect. He thought he was above everybody else. And he wanted people to take this uh, posture uh, of worship in front of him. The only person we should be worshiping is God, not ourselves. And the third God that is worshiped is the God of Asherah. This is the worship of pleasure. This worship of pleasure is actually quite in like a a sexual sense more so, this worship of lust, this worship to look at pornography. Now let's let's be real for a minute. (laughs) The culture that we live in, this one is huge. Every single year at Chi Alpha, we do this, what I call dating series, and we talk pretty deep about pornography and and the effects that it has on your life. And man, the statistics are unreal about how many people are addicted to pornography and, and, and they lust over this and they make this type of stuff their God. They make these things, these sexual images into their number one and foremost, most priority and it becomes their God and it is absolutely a sin. You see, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had this set up, and when they played this music, the music that they played was a sensual type of music, and he was engaging this type of worship for all people. Our statistics for pornography, it says some like 80% of males are addicted to pornography, teenage males. Females is like 70%. That's on a rise and that always shocks everybody. You look at books like Fifty Shades of Grey and stuff like that. Like that's all for female and it's all this sensual desire and lust to to put this of a priority over God. (laughs) It's a sin. We look at sex trafficking. It is so rampant in our society. It is all over the place. Our world and our culture is trying to get us in this sin. You look at website searches and they say the number one search in all of websites is pornography related. It's disgusting. The world knows that Satan knows that that we sin and that Christians are sinners just as much anybody. We have to get to a point where God is our number one priority. And when God is our priority, the other stuff is no longer as important to us. Where are we? Like I said at the beginning, I think some of us might be quite convicted. (laughs) I am, as I was working through this message. I think maybe sports take that for me sometimes. Is God the only God that I truly worship? But there's there's some things that we need to commit to. Let me read a few statements. Maybe we need to make this commitment. I will not make the secular sights and sounds of modern culture more important than God. I will not support my secular culture's demand to compromise my faith. 
I will resist the appeals of culture gods to be first in my life. I will not yield to fleshly desires to make myself and my pleasures the center of my life. I will be fully dedicated follower of Jesus Christ and he will be the first in my life. Friends, I want us to make this commitment. I want us right here, right now to say, I commit that Jesus will be my first, that Jesus will be my everything. He is my number one priority and nothing else is above Jesus. (laughs) Is Jesus our first or does Jesus get our leftovers? (laughs) Third thing that I want to make the point of is this. You will need to know how to stand your ground against the worship of false gods. How do we stand our ground when false gods are around us everywhere we look? They are literally everywhere. So how do we say, you know what, I'm going to stand my ground and I'm going to make a clear decision every day that God is first in my life. How do we do that? First thing, letter A, know who you are in Christ. In other words, know your identity. Because if our identity is put in something that can be changed or taken away, we will be left hurt and broken every single time. Who are you in Christ? You are a child of God. You are loved by God. He loves you with everything that he has in you. You are owned by God. And if we know that for a fact, it makes it so much easier to put him as our number one priority. B, know and believe God's word, the Holy Bible, as the standard of truth. (laughs) I've heard, I've literally heard this phrase before, what is true for you is true for you, and what is true for me is true for me. That's bogus. This is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I believe this to be completely accurate, to be completely inspired by God. We have to believe in the biblical truth. I think part of the reason that our culture is wavering so much is because most of our culture does not believe this to be the whole truth. This is the truth. We can't waver from the truth and start justifying some of our sins because, oh, you know what, and and we start to make up reasons that it's okay. No, this is is the resolve to be committed to God first and foremost. Are we really committed to God the first in our life? Every year at, at Chi Alpha, I've talked about Chi Alpha a lot today. I love Chi Alpha. I love our teens. It's been a great year. But this year at Chi Alpha, we have a theme, and we do every year. And this year, our theme is called Christ first. That comes from our youth group name, which is Chi Alpha, which is taken from the letters, the Greek letters X and A, which means X means Christ. A means first. Christ, as you might have seen like Xmas before, that actually means Christmas. So Christ first. A means the alpha or the beginning or first. So Christ first is what we're talking about this whole entire year. And how can we make our priority list to put God our first and foremost? One way I've been saying at Chi Alpha is when we wake up in the morning, Jesus should be the first thing on our minds. We should pray first thing in the morning. As we live our day, every single day in the middle of our life, Jesus should be our thoughts. We should pray without ceasing, never stopping to think about Jesus. At the end of our day, our last thought of the day should be thinking about Jesus. Is Christ really first and foremost in our life or does he come as an afterthought for some of us? You see, our number one priority is Christ, is Jesus. Do we keep it there? Letter uh, D, remember you will be tested. If you were here at church last week, we talked a lot about being tested and there are gonna be tests, there are going to be trials, there are gonna be many, many times where Satan tries to attempt to get us to sin. How do we respond to those tests? Letter E, rejoice through the testing. We looked at passage of scripture after passage of scripture, I think like seven of them last week, of we can rejoice in our trials. When we are going through difficult situations and difficult circumstances, we can say, God, thank you for building my endurance. And as my endurance is built, that builds my character. And as my character is built, that gives my hope and salvation in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You will be tested and you can rejoice in those testings. Letter F, 
recognize the false gods around you and reject them. Maybe this is a great beginning point for some of us. Recognize, man, there are false gods in my life. There are things that are commanding my calendar and my bank account, and I'm going to recognize those, and I'm not going to justify those, and I'm going to realize that they are trying to take priority over God, and what can I do to make sure that they don't? G, draw a line in the sand and choose to stand on God's side. Maybe we need to draw this metaphorical line down and say, over there, man, th that, that is the things of the world, and I'm not going to partake in those things, and I'm going to stay on this side. One of my favorite things to do is to disc golf, and when, when you disc golf, your disc lands on the ground, and you take a disc, but they call this, this there's this line that you can't cross, and if you cross this line, it's called a foot fault. I want to say spiritually, sometimes we get too close to this line and we kind of lose our balance a little bit and we foot fault spiritually. We need to be so careful to have this line drawn that we distance ourselves from the line of this culture, of this sin, of, of viewing false gods. And we need to distance ourselves as, way, as far away from that line as we can. Don't even get close to the line or we are going to end up foot faulting. <laughs> That's an extra stroke in disc golf. That's not a good thing. In life, it's worse than an extra stroke. Man, give all of our devotion, everything that we have to Jesus. Letter H, take action to put God first. Here's a reality. We can talk about all of these things all day long. We can talk about how much we need to do these things. We can talk about our calendar and our bank account. We can talk about them. But all of it is worthless until we make the commitment to put this into action. What are the things in my personal life that I escalate over God? What action steps am I going to take to make sure that Jesus is first? Maybe I'm going to start waking up in the morning and reading the Bible every single day. At Chi Alpha, we've started this Bible in a Year plan where we read through the Bible in a year. And last year, we encouraged our whole church to start reading through the Bible in a year. There's like, I think there's 79 of us that signed up for this plan to read through the Bible in a year. That includes the whole church. We're starting again November 15th. I'd love for you to commit to, man, we're going to read through the Bible in a year together as a church. And what are some other things that we can do to take these action steps to show God is my first priority? When sometimes I want to listen to secular music that talks about a bunch of junk, maybe I'm going to choose to listen to worship music instead that will lead me closer to Jesus. What are some action steps that we can take, that you personally can take for some things that maybe you're doing? Plenty of action steps for whatever your God is. For me, it's sports. I'm going to put God above my sports, and there are plenty of things that we can do to make that happen. What action steps do we take? I want to close with this story. Some of you have probably heard it before. About 150 years ago, there were some missionaries. They were from England and Germany, and they went to Northeast India to preach the gospel. One person in this tribe experienced Jesus and gave his life over to Jesus. The tribe leader, the chief, he found out about this, and he looks at this man who gave everything to Jesus and said, I want you to renounce your faith. And the man said, I will not renounce my faith. And the chief said, you renounce your faith right now or I will take a bow and arrow and I will literally shoot your kids right now. <laughs> to which the man responded, this man who had just experienced Jesus, who gave his life to Jesus, he began by singing these words. Now, it's very rare that you hear me sing, but I'm going to attempt to sing these words. This is why they don't have me up on the worship team, but we'll see what happens. And he sings these words. He says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And they take the chief commands the officers to take the arrow and they shoot the kids. They fall on the ground and they're down on the ground. They're twitching at almost death. And the chief looks at this guy who just experienced Jesus and says, all right, renounce your faith or I'm shooting your wife too. Yeah. To which the man responded, I'll save y'all. Oh no, I'll sing. It sounds fine. I see lots of smiles. That's fine. I don't mind being made fun of. That's great. And then he responded with this. He says, though no one joins me, 
still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. He says, I'm not gonna turn back. I'm not going to do anything. And what does the chief do? Commands his officers and shoots his wife. And now the officer says, or the chief says, I will give you one more chance. And this is your chance. If you don't renounce your faith right now, I am going to kill even you. To which the man responded. You have to hear me sing one more time. So sorry, pals. To which the man responded, he said, though no one joins me, still I will follow Oh wait, that was the last one. To which he says, the cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. And at this point, he had no chance to turn back. And the chief commanded the officers and they shot this man and he died on the spot. You see, this man, he was committed to Jesus being his number one priority. He said, I don't care about anything else. I don't care what the culture, I don't care what the world, I don't care what the chief has to say. Jesus is my number one, and I don't care what anyone else has to think about that. (laughs) Are we willing to raise our hands a little bit in worship? Are we willing to even sing, even though we're embarrassed at singing, and say, man, I am going to give Jesus Priority. Because here's what happens. When we put Jesus as our number one priority, people start to see Jesus through us. That story doesn't end there. This man died, but the chief is like, wow, there has to be something to this. 2,000 years ago, this man named Jesus lived, and this guy 2,000 years later is willing to die for him. The chief ended up recognizing who Jesus was, and by the Holy Spirit conviction, the chief accepted Jesus into his life. This chief, yeah, yeah, I agree, that that deserves some applause. This chief ended up telling his whole tribe that he accepted Jesus into his life, and the whole tribe then became Christians. All of this happened because of this one man's decision to say, no matter what, I choose to follow Jesus. Friends, in the culture where they try and get us to bow down at something else, are we going to say Jesus is my number one priority? No matter what happens to me, I give everything to Jesus. Man, I look at my life and I'm like, man, would I be willing to do what this man did, what this new Christian did? Would I be willing to do that? (laughs) Would we be willing to do that? Jesus has to be number one priority. Let's pray. Jesus, (laughs) you gave us a tough message today. (laughs) I feel like several of us, including myself, is quite convicted. All that you want is is us. (laughs) You ask us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So starting today, Jesus, help us to take action steps to give you everything. Jesus, I love you so much, and I want to show you that. I want to show you that you are my number one priority, so help me to do that in my life. Jesus, help us each to do that. Whatever things we have been making, our gods, our false gods, idolatry, help us to push those on the back burner and say, you are my one and only God, and I will worship you forever. God, you are good. We worship you, and we worship your name alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.